Hello class. So today we are going to be going over Acts 9 and 10. Um, that means that Acts 7 and 8, the um, Google Forms, is due today at noon, of course. Um, in any case, hopefully you, you read this before you watch the video or you can just follow along with me. Um, I'm going to be giving you notes on the chapter, but you know, you're still supposed to read it and obviously turn in the summaries the following day. So let us begin in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. So we're finally getting to Saul, who, as we know, becomes Paul. Great name, by the way. So uh, we have... Verse two, I have my, my first note listed. Um, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So we're talking about Paul trying to find Christians to, um, like as it says, uh, imprison them. So I want you to write for this note that uh, that the way as it is mentioned here, was a name used by early Christians um, to uh, refer to themselves, right? The early Christian community is the way, essentially. So that is one note. I mean, other people could look at it as, you know, it's referring to G Jesus, they belong to Jesus, but that is um, what scholars have said about this passage. Now, uh, we also have verse eight here um Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes he could see nothing so they led him by hand uh by the hand into Damascus right so he could see nothing now this is a huge symbolic thing because this is showing that he was spiritually blind of course right um or or you know he he had religious blindness as Saul the persecutor um, this is a temporary blindness, though, because what happens? He's shown the light. Well, again, but in a different way, because that's what blinds him here. Um, and then, like, scales, you know, fall off of his eyes, and then he can see again. And so, anyway, the, the, but the note that it, it symbol, the note is that it symbolizes that he was um, spiritually blind, but he's going to be able to see. As we all know, he's going to become one of the greatest uh, evangelists of all time, if not the greatest. So, moving on. Um, this note is actually for verses 19 to 30, right? So, uh, you know, from here on out, maybe, it, yeah, because this is still part of 19, this section. So basically, you know, we got Saul, who is an enemy of the Christians, right? But what's he do? Well, he starts preaching the name of Jesus, right? He, once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God at once, okay? Well, guess what? Now he's hated by the Jews. So Saul is between a rock and a hard place, right? Because the Christians are afraid of him, right? He was just trying to imprison them all. I mean, nobody trusts him, and rightfully so. And then the Jews, you know, are expecting this guy to be capturing these people. And now he's preaching their message. He's becoming one of them. So obviously they want to kill him right that is infuriating so that note um you know you could put that uh christians were afraid to accept him at first because of his previous persecution of them and jews wanted to kill him for preaching that jesus is the messiah while he's supposed to be persecuting the christians okay um that is the note but obviously the christians end up accepting him and that makes his life much better um 
but it's only through who barnabas right it's only through barnabas that um that he is accepted into the community so <clears throat> let's go down to a verse 31 here then the church throughout judea galilee and samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthening and strengthened sorry living in the fear of the lord and encouraged by the holy spirit it increased in numbers so is it any accident you think that luke put that the church enjoyed a time of peace after their biggest persecutor is now a christian it's like no so <laughs> this is just emphasizing how much saul was persecuting the church right like that they're actually experiencing a time of peace now that he's converted all right that's huge so uh yeah the note what should be the church was able to have some peace because saul wasn't constantly persecuting them okay all right so um we'll go down here to 43 um although it should be noted that tabitha was a uh, a holy woman because she's doing good and helping the poor and what did luke emphasize his gospel with helping the poor right that was his main uh correlation with holiness you might say is that do you help the poor yes or no um so he put a big emphasis on that and so whenever he's saying somebody you know helps the poor that means they're a holy person according to luke and vice versa so uh, anyway after and, and i also want to mention sorry keep on getting off track but i i just keep realizing there's a bunch of good stuff here that i'm skipping over um Peter actually raises somebody from the dead. That is like worth mentioning, right? Like right here, bam, raises somebody from the dead. So that's huge. The only person that I know to do that is Jesus. So pretty wild. Okay. And uh, now we got, let's see here. Yeah, verse 43. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner, with a tanner named Simon. Now you should know. Here's the note that Jews found tanners unclean. It shouldn't come as a shock because they found virtually everybody unclean, but they they found tanners unclean because um, if you know anything about what a tanner does, is that they take animal hides and turn them into leather. Right? That's what tanners do. Well, tanners, by doing that, touch animals that Jews aren't allowed to even touch, right? So I, I'll even give the verse here. This is from Leviticus 11. Uh, the carcass of any animal which divides the foot, but is not cloven hoofed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. And whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until, ev until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. Okay. So, I mean, it's plainly spoken here. Like, don't touch this stuff. Fair enough. So that's what the Jews think. And Peter is staying with this guy. So this is actually foreshadowing because in the next chapter, the whole point is that Peter has to come to grips with the fact that the Christian message is not meant solely for the Jews. All right. So anyway, um, yeah, the note for 43 should be that uh, Jews found tanners the tanning occupation to be unclean. So this is very significant that Peter is actually staying with a tanner, right? For both Gentiles and Jews, because that means that Gentiles have a shot here <laughs> at salvation. At least it's, it's a little foreshadowing about that. So let's move on. Let's go to chapter 10. All right, now we have Cornelius. So, um, 
uh, verses one and two, right from the gate. All right, no pun intended here because Cornelius is actually a proselyte of the gate. If you read this closely enough, you could kind of probably figure it out. Um, it says, you know, he's a God fearer, um, but he's a centurion, right? So what is he? He's a Gentile, right? He's part of the Roman army. And in fact, it says he was part of the Italian regiment. And this Italian regiment was actually an, an auxiliary unit of archers. Um, so actually, let's just write those as notes. because I want you to know that. So uh, verse, but you can put chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Cornelius is a proselyte of the gate. And he was part of the Italian regiment, which was an auxiliary, an auxiliary unit of archers. Auxiliary unit of archers. I can't say my words right right now. In any case, um, I also want you to know that uh, that Luke says here he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly, which I hope to be known as a guy who prays to God regularly. I need to up my game in that department. Um, I'm sure you know, we could all say that about ourselves, but uh, anyway, that's pretty cool. So he gave generously. Like, what did I say about Tabitha? That, you know, she was a giver to the poor. And again, that's there's that association there. Like, you're a holy person, according to Luke, if you give to the poor. Okay. So they have the right attitude toward wealth essentially right both tabitha and cornelius that's the note um there for verse two anyway now we're going to talk about peter's vision now when i read this um you know i like to do my due diligence and um you know study up on what other people have to say about you know the bible but when i read it you know i also um, with my own previous or prior understanding, try to look at it through my own lens, I guess, and, and, and see. Not, not, not saying I try to interpret it differently than the church. Like, I'm not, you know, um, I'm not a Protestant in that case. But um, uh, I, I try to see what the author is saying based on what I know about him already, because I like to think I know a little bit about Luke. Um, so... Here's the vision, right? Um, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds, which by the way, not allowed to eat reptiles and birds if you are a Jew or bats, by the way. Um, then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. It's like, what? What? Surely not, Lord, Peter replies. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Then a voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, this happens three times. And immediately, the sheet was taken back to heaven. Okay. Wild. Wild. And, and here's why. Um, when I read that, I'm like, what does he mean? Well, remember that verse I just told you about Leviticus, right? You know, the Jews had a very strict dietary law, which we've talked about. The Pharisees, there are the Pharisees overemphasize that, right? And that's why Jesus criticizes them so much. But the whole purpose of that was to separate the Jews from the Gentiles. That's it. That's the whole reason for circumcision too, by the way, right? It's like, they want to be separate, right? If you love me, you'll do this, you know, kind of thing. Um, or in a sense, you will choose me by doing this. You will show with your actions, right? And God placed these, this, this uh, requirement upon the Jews, you know, like I said, to separate themselves, to show that they're choosing him. But with the death and resurrection and ascension of our Lord, it's like now the Gentiles are ready to become God's people too. 
right? So you don't need these requirements anymore. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't, you don't need to um, refrain from eating these four-footed animals and reptiles and birds. I mean, I just ate an alligator po' boy uh, last year when I went to New Orleans, right? Wouldn't be allowed to eat that if I was a Jew, um, you know, eating kosher. So um, point is, when I looked at the vision, I'm like, I think what he's trying to say is that like, one, these animals actually have become, you know, so associated with the Gentiles that they, that, that they're like a symbol of them, right? And so this is saying that you, you should accept them, right? You should accept that food now because you should accept them. So um, anyway, that was my thoughts on it. But, uh, but it's good to read this in context because what happens after this? I mean, you should have read it. Maybe, you know, if you're following along with me, that's fine too. Well, um, they get together to eat a meal, right? Him and Cornelius and Cornelius's friends, right? Because they both have visions about each other, essentially. And um, this is really to ease Peter's conscience, right? Like, so that he could accept whatever food that Cornelius has without any reservations. He's like, all right, I was told, eat it. So I'm gonna eat it. Um, so the note I want you to write is, uh, you know, chapter 10, verses 9 to 16. The vision is intended to prepare Peter to share the food of Cornelius's household without qualms of conscience, or like I said, or reservations, you might say. Um, the necessity of such instructions to Peter reveals that at first, not even the apostles fully grasp the implications of Jesus's teaching on the law. In Acts, the initial insight belongs to St. Stephen. Okay, that's the whole note. Not even the apostles fully understood it. It took Jesus giving a vision to Peter. Okay, that is significant. Right, and this is actually what helps, um, you know, the Council of Jerusalem, which uh, is like the unofficial first ecumenical council even though obviously we talked about that is um you know 325 is the the first ecumenical council in nicaea but this is like the unofficial one in acts you might say it's about accepting gentiles um into the faith you know and and not having to follow these mosaic laws okay like being able to eat um whatever you want being able to uh not be circumcised. And these proselytes of the gate, like we mentioned, they already kind of do that. There are like Jews without those requirements. So it's much more easy for them to accept the Christian message than even the Jews really. You know, because it because to the, the Jews, it seemed like Jesus was like spitting on their faith. But to the um, to the Gentiles, it's like or the proselytes of the gate, which who were Gentiles. You know, they don't they don't care about the dietary law because if they did, they would they would follow it. So um, anyway, that's the note for that. Um, moving on, we got uh, verses 17 to 23 is the the next note. And. Um, you know, you could just say that the arrival of these gentiles um with their account of the angelic apparition that they had uh illuminates peter's vision that he is to be he is to be prepared to admit gentiles who were considered unclean like the animals of his vision into the christian community right so i don't think i was that far off of maybe my understanding of it but um anyway there's that. And then now um, let's talk about Peter at Cornelius's house. So, and I know this is probably a longer video than the normal. Bear with me. Um, 
Yeah, we, we, uh, we're going to, oh, I should also mention this. We're going to cover, you know, nine and 10 and 11 and 12 Tuesday, and then 13 and 14 Wednesday. But then that's halfway through Acts. And what do we traditionally do when reading these books? We have a test um, once we get to the halfway point because it's just so much content. And so uh, anyway, I'd like to have a test on the first half of Acts next week. But that test wouldn't be until Wednesday. Because Tuesday we'd review. Monday we don't have class, right? So we'd have a test on Wednesday next week. You got that? So that'll also be on your on, under the lesson plans that you have, of course. But um, just an FYI, okay? If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I recommend that, even though I put questions on the the Google Forms, it's probably better to email me if you have a really significant question because uh, I'm more likely to see that. Um, even though I do, I look at the Google Forms, but um, sometimes I, I just forget to respond because it's not like there's a reply button, you know. So anyway, um, let's see. We want to do verses 24 to 27 now. So from here to here. All right. Um, I want you to put that, uh, that Cornelius is so impressed with his apparition that he invites his close personal friends to join him with his meeting with Peter. Right. So there's that. But also his understanding of this person he's about to meet is not uh, devoid of superstition, um, which is suggested by his falling down onto his knees before Peter, right? So you could say that's that's the note, because obviously Peter, you know, he says, "Stand up! I am only a man myself," right? He's trying to say, "Don't be, you know, kneeling down and worshiping me. I'm just, you know, Joe Schmo. Literally, I was just a fisherman. You know, it's crazy how I'm leading this thing now." That's only because of Jesus. He gives all the glory to Jesus. That's why he's a saint. So, um, now, here is the, the, la the last verses that we're going to take, take notes on. Um, verses 45 to 48 now, chapter 10. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So there are some Protestants. Um, I do know like one, set, one sect specifically, um, the Pentecostals, which I think I've told you, I used to go to a youth group with them. That's why I probably know so much about them. But uh, they believe in two different baptisms, right? A baptism of water and a baptism of the spirit, right? I mean, they're two separate occasions, right? And obviously, we don't think that. We think that they are the same thing, you know? Once you receive baptism, you know, with the water, you're also receiving the Holy Spirit as well. And, uh, and they'll use as a verse to defend their side or these verses. But, you know... To us, this is just an exceptional case, right? Um, we don't think this is the norm. And so I'd like you to put that the, the story of Cornelius and his companions in Acts 10 is the one time in the New Testament that anyone is described as receiving the Holy Spirit prior to baptism. This is considered simply an exceptional case. And... Uh, I think I've told you this before when talking about limbo and how church changed how the church changed its stance on that, or at least its teaching. You could still believe in limbo, um, but this is in the Catechism, twelve fifty seven. If you want to look it up? God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but He Himself is not bound by His sacraments, right? And this answers a bunch of different questions. But this is one of them, right? That you know they receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized by water. And that's because, like the Catechism says, God is not bound by his sacraments. So, um, you know, it's no 
wonder though why he would choose this to be the exception because this is the first time that gentiles are received into the church um, and the first ones to get baptized right so that's a pretty big deal and this miracle of sorts or this exception to the rule um, definitely shows that this is what god wanted in a way so that is the lesson for today um hope you enjoyed it i did so uh god bless you and i will see you next time